Yeah, can you guys see my slide? Yes. Okay, um, okay. Assalamualaikum and good morning to Dr. Alwi and friends. My name is Siti Nuraisha and I will be presenting about chest tube insertion in pediatrics. Okay, um, chest tube insertion, also known as thoracostomy, is a minimally invasive procedure uh, where a tube or small catheter is placed through the chest wall into the pleural cavity. It is used to drain air of fluid. Uh, the indications for chest tube insertion are in case of pneumothorax, either tension or spontaneous pneumothorax. In tension pneumothorax, uh, the trachea is deviated away from the affected lung and the mediastinum is shifted to the opposite side opposite side of the chest. The okay, other is hemoth uh, hemothorax from blunt or penetrating chest trauma. Uh, blunt trauma like motor vehicle accident and penetrating trauma such as step wounds. Uh, significant pleural effusion is also indicated for chest tube insertion. Uh, chest tube, insertion, chest tube is, uh, use in pleurodesis to deliver medication into the pleural space. Uh, pleurodesis is a procedure that uses medication to adhere the lung to the chest wall to prevent recurrent pleural effusions, pneumothorax, or to treat a persistent pneumothorax. Uh, the last one is empyema, chest tube insertion along with antibiotic prescription. Uh, for contraindication, uh, chest tube insertion is relatively uh, contraindicated in patients with anticoagulant, uh, coagulopathy where the INR uh, more than 1.5 or with a platelet count uh, less than 50,000, and patients with overlying skin infection. And it is absolutely contraindicated if lack of informed consent or patient uh, cooperation. Okay, uh, the commonest uh, complication uh, of chest tube uh, is chest tube malabsorption, uh, malposition, uh, with intraparenchymal and intrafissural locations uh, being the most common. Other is infection, uh, including empyema and surgical site infection. Uh, intercostal nerve, blood vessel, and organ injuries can also happen. And last one is re-expansion pulmonary edema, which is rare but may be a life-threatening complication. Okay, so the preferred site for chest tube uh, insertion is the safe triangle, as you can see in the picture. Uh, this is the triangle uh, bordered uh, by the anterior border of the latissimus dorsi, uh, the lateral border of the pectoralis major muscle, base of the axilla and the fifth intercostal space or superior to the horizontal level of the nipple. Okay, uh, before uh, starting the procedure, uh, get the written consent uh, from the parents, explain how the procedure will be done and uh, the complications of the procedure, and then prepare the equipment, uh, sedate the child with midazolam, position the child with ipsilateral arm fully abducted, and then clean with chlorhexidine and wrap the skin, uh, infiltrate a uh, local anesthesia uh, like lidocaine into the skin at the fourth or fifth intercostal space on the mid axillary line. Uh, this procedure is very painful even in the adult. Okay, uh, next step, uh, approximate length of the chest tube to be inserted. Uh, as it follows the curve of the chest for pneumothorax, the, uh, the tip of the chest tube should be seated at the highest point of the chest. And for pleural effusion, it should be at the lowest dependent chest. Okay, uh, next, uh, make a small incision in the skin just above the fifth uh, rib. Use the blunt forceps to dissect through the subcutaneous tissue and puncture the parietal pleural with the tip of the clamp forceps. Uh, put a glove finger into the incision and clear the path into the pleural. And this uh, may be difficult in a small child. Advance the chest tip into the pleural space during expiration. Okay, for drainage of air, uh, roll the child slightly to the opposite side for easier maneuvering and advancement of the chest tube anteriorly. Uh, place the tip of the chest tube at the incision, uh, point the catheter tip anteriorly and slowly advance the chest tube. However, for drainage or of empyema, maintain the child in the supine position and point the catheter tip posteriorly and proceed with the rest of the procedure. And then uh, connect uh, the chest tube to the, under, to the underwater seal and secure the chest tube with first string switches in children or sterile tip strips in units. And connect the underwater seal to suction pump if necessary for empyema. And lastly, confirm the position with a chest x-ray. And for your information, uh, the, the technique that I just explained is the open method uh, without the use of troca. 
and it is preferred than closed method because less risk in terms of internal organ penetration. And the closed method uh, is no longer recommended. And the picture at the bottom right is example of what underwater uh, seal drainage. And the water should uh, bub uh, bubble if pneumothorax and the fluid moves with respiration if the chest tube is in the pleural space. And I think uh, that's all uh, from me. This is my references and this is uh, some further reading. You can uh, watch the video on the YouTube. Okay, that's very good. Uh, I think that's quite comprehensive. Uh, okay, I just got one question. So what's the difference between uh, chest tube placement for pneumothorax uh, and pleural effusion, where do you want to point the tip of the chest tube to, towards? Okay, uh, for the um, for the pneumothorax, since uh, uh, since uh, we should put the tip of the uh, uh, chest tube uh, at the highest point. While the highest point, come on. Uh, for example, if the child is lying supine, we must uh, we must uh, uh, advance the uh, the tip of the chest tube anteriorly. Uh, ah, while okay, for the pleural effusion, it must be posteriorly. <coughs> okay, good. So in baby, it will be difficult. Huh? So in baby, you should you just point anteriorly. Tapi in older children, where they, where they can sit up, I thought you can actually incline the bed. Uh, you have to point towards apex. Okay. Okay. Okay, Doctor. So, kalau purification? Um, it should be uh, posteriorly or uh, lower, I mean, a bottom lah. Because, uh, because uh, plural efficient should be at the by best, right? So, it, it should point uh, downward or posteriorly. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, so, let's uh, proceed with the next one. <clears throat> okay, uh, so can you see my slide? Can. Okay, okay. Okay, so Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Afin Afidin Ismail and insyaAllah today I will cover on the topic bladder catheterization. <coughs> okay, so for the equipment, uh, basically the uh, equipment for the bladder catheterization uh, can be found in the catheterization kit. So what we need to have is uh, we need to have the sterile drips and sterile gloves and antiseptic solution uh, such as chlorhexidine cotton balls uh, and forceps, the catheter, which is uh, usually we use the for the catheter, the sterile lubricant, uh, syringe with water for the balloon inflation, the drainage bag, the viscous lidocaine as the local anesthesia, the tape or any securing device. So uh, for the folic catheter, there are several types of the folic catheter, whether it consists of the double lumen or triple lumen, so for the triple lumen, it has the additional port for the bladder irrigation in patient with uh, grossy material or clots. And for the tips of catheter, it can be either straight or uh, coude tips, which is the band one. And having said that, the folic catheter with the double lumen is the most frequent type of the catheter that, uh, that has been used. So uh, this is the table of the catheter size uh, used uh, based on the age that I have found in the Royal Children's Hospital in the Melbourne. But basically in the PITS protocol, we use uh, four French for the children below three kilogram body weight, while six French uh, for the children more than three kilogram. And in older children, uh, we can use uh, six to 10 French. And for your information, one French is equal to the 0 0.3 millimeter. Okay, so <clears throat> for bladder catheterization, it is indicated for either diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. 
For diagnostic, it is to obtain the uncontaminated urine sample for my microbiological testing to measure urinary output in critically ill patient or during the procedure and to measure the post white residual. And for the therapeutic purpose, uh, we can use the catheterization to decompress the bladder in patient with acute or chronic urinary retention and to facilitate the bladder irrigation. And for contraindication, it is absolutely contraindicated in patients that have the urethral injury, whether from trauma or pelvic fracture. And the other complication uh, consists of uh, urethral stricture, recent urethra or bladder surgery, and in uncooperative patient. And for complication, uh, we, uh, the catheterization can cause the urinary tract infection, parafimosis, uh, trauma to the urethra or bladder, urethral stricture, and psychological trauma. So uh, before we proceed with the Prepare, uh, before we proceed with the procedure, let's look at the preparation, which is uh, as usual, we must gain consent and explain the procedure to the parent and to the patient if the patient is uh, age is appropriate. Ensure the patient's privacy is maintained and there is chaperone uh, presence during the procedure. Prepare the equipment, uh, check the balloon integrity, uh, secure securely attach the catheter to the collection tubing for the antiseptic solution on the cotton ball and lubricate the distal tip of the catheter and wash your hands. So for the procedure, we must uh, place the patient in the supine position or frog leg position and have the chaperone to expose the patient's genitals. And place the stri absorbent pad under the patient and in uh, uncircumcised male patient, retract the foreskin. So before we insert the catheter, we need to clean the patient's genital region and in male, hold uh, the penis with a non-nominant hand and the hand now is considered to be non-sterile. So we should not let go or touch any sterile equipment with the hands and cleanse the glands in the circular motion using the forceps and antiseptic soap cotton ball with the dominant hand. Then discard the used glove, wash hands and wear the new glove. So place the drip over the genital region without covering the penis and place the dry urine collection bowl below the penis. So to clean the genital region in female, separate the labia with the non-dominant hand while using the dominant hand to clean the urethra meatus and labia direct <coughs> to clean the clean the urethra meatus and the labia directed from the clitoris to the anus and surrounding region with the sterile forceps and cotton ball. And the rest uh, is the same as in the female. So after we cleanse the genital region, we need to apply the local anesthesia. So in male, we hold the penis vertically with the dominant with the non-dominant hand. And then we inject the viscous lidocaine into the urethra with the uh, with the dominant hand and we pinch the ends of the Penis for several minutes to retain the lidocaine in the urethra. So uh, in female, we part the labia with the non-dominant hand and we apply the stri local anesthesia into the urethral meatus with other hand. And similarly, we wait for three to five minutes for the lidocaine to take the effect. So for the catheter insertion, uh, warn the patient that you are about to insert the catheter. And in male, Hold the penis uh, upright, perpendicular to the body plane. So insert the catheter slowly and gently to the urethra. But if the codec catheter, the band uh, tips is used, so point the tip of the catheter upward at the 12 o'clock. And we continue to advance the catheter. And as the catheter reaches the external sphincter, so some resistance may be felt. And we can ask the patient to breathe deeply to relax the sphincter, And we should not use a force to, uh, on the catheter to avoid any injury. So continue inserting the catheter gently until urine is flowing. So absence of urine in the collecting tube signifies that uh, empty bladder or improper placement. So when the placement is confirmed, uh, inflate the balloon with the water and gently pull back the catheter to make it sit against the bladder wall. And pull back the foreskin in uncircumcised patient and secure the tubing and hand the collection back in the dependent position. And in female, 
maintain the lab uh, to insert the catheter we maintain the labia to be apart and place the tip of the catheter into the urethra and insert it upwards at the 30 degree angle until the urine flow so after the urine flows we insert the catheter 5 cm further and we inflate the balloon so and the rest is the same as in male so uh, this is just the simplified version uh, with the picture so as you can see uh, the cleaning the injecting the local anesthesia the catheter insertion the inflation and yeah so i think uh, that's all for me you can watch the video in the youtube that uh, based on the link that i i have provided i think that's all Okay, I will continue for the question. Okay, I'll continue. Mm, can you guys see the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hey, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, saya tak tahu dia, dia, dia start tak tadi. Okay, anyway. Uh, ada soalan nak untuk CBD tadi? I have a question. Huh. Um, uh, does the catheter for male and female uh, is different? Because uh, so, like uh, if the catheter for male is much more longer or like something like that, is it different? Okay, ada. Uh, presenter, ada, so ada jawapan? Um, from what I have read, there is uh, no difference in the catheter use and I don't find any difference, so I assume the catheter is the same. Okay, basically the catheter is the same. Okay, the catheter is the same. Cuma the insertion length tu different. Okay, usually in female, it depends lah kalau you buat kat neonates ke kat baby ke. But usually in female, you just insert like 5 cm, 6 cm. Kalau baby kan, yeah, just insert like 5 cm, that's enough. Don't don't proceed sampai to the end. Kalau jangan masuk sampai habis in female. Especially in unit. Sebab one of the complications is bladder rupture. You boleh rupture the bladder. So just masuk 5 cm je in baby. Tapi in older children, you boleh masuk up to 7, 8 cm. Kalau female. Kalau male, you insert sampai habis. Okay. And then you inflate, you dah masuk habis, baru you inflate, then you tarik. Faham? Do not, never, never you masuk sikit and you inflate. Because in in male, complication is higher lah. You boleh dapat uh, uterine apa? Uh, uterine rupture, uh, stricture, macam-macam. So, make sure you masuk in male lah, you masuk sampai habis. Okay. Ataupun nak dekat habis, and then kalau baby lah, baby cute just masuk sampai towards the end and then you inflate, then you pull. Okay? Okay lah, uh, continue lah. Next. ATP. Okay. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So I'm going to present uh, on the procedure of doing neonatal endotracheal intubation. And so um, basically uh, intubation is to provide mechanical ventilation when the <coughs> baby can no longer breathe on uh, on their own. Okay, so for indication, um, first when the back and mass ventilation, uh, that the picture that I provide, or continuous positive airway pressure is insufficient for the baby. And also for prolonged positive pressure ventilation or direct suctioning of the trachea, and to maintain and protect the airway and also for diaphragmatic hernia. Okay, so for contraindication, there is no um, absolute contraindication 
but if the operator is inexperienced in intubation, then um, she or he needs to perform uh, back and mass ventilation till uh, help arrives or till a physician that are experienced in intubation can do the intubation. For equipment, um, you will need back and mass with high oxygen flow, uh, laryngoscope, uh, blades uh, and blades uh, for infant and older children is uh, you need to use different blade. Uh, uh, for example, straight blade for infant and a curved blade for older children. And the blade also has a different size, different size. Uh, where for infant you uh, you have to use size one, and for older children you have to use a uh, size two. And for endotracheal tubes, uh, there will also um, the tube size that uh, is um, appropriate or need to be used uh, according to weight of the baby or age of the baby, um, where I put the table down there. And also you will need stylet, uh, but it's, it is optional. Uh, suction catheter and device, uh, scissors and adhesive tape. Uh, pulse oximeter and ECG monitoring, uh, sedation, uh, muscle relaxant, and also stethoscope. Okay, so for complication, uh, they can um, you can accidentally uh, did esophageal intubation instead of endotracheal intubation, where the endotracheal tube instead of go. Uh, into the lung, it will go uh, to the stomach and um, will cause um, problem to the stomach. Huh? Okay, um, can also cause right lung intubation, trauma to the upper airway, uh, pneumothorax, and also subglottic uh, stenosis. Okay, so for procedure, uh, first you have positioned the infant with a head in midline and slightly extended, or we call it is uh, in sniffling position, uh, like the picture that I've uh, put up there. And also, um, you have to continue back and mass ventilation up to three minutes uh, if necessary. But if uh, the patient is in cardiac arrest, then you, you just uh, proceed with uh, intubation. So the back and mass ventilation, um, the, the oxygen saturation is uh, 100% until um, the, the newborn's oxygen saturation is between 94 to 98%. Okay, so uh, you can also use uh, medication to help um, make this intubation process easier. For example, you can use uh, induction agent, uh, muscle relaxant, and uh, also sedation, uh, which is the IV midazolam. Um, <clears throat> but uh, for muscle relaxant, you have to use with uh, caution because um, you have to, to back the patient well, and also you have to, to have good intubation skills because then you might not uh, later see the, the chest rise of the patient. Okay, so uh, then you have to uh, also monitor the child's vital sign continuously. And uh, when, when you've done all that, you can now introduce the, the blade between the tongue and also the palate uh, of the child with left hand and uh, advance to the back of the tongue while um, the assistant uh, secures the child head. When you see uh, epiglottis, you lift the blade upward and uh, outward to visualize the vocal cord, like the picture in the below. And um, if there is secretion that uh, make you cannot visualize the uh, anatomy, anatomical structure, you can suck the secretions. And um, using the right hand, you insert the endotracheal tube from the right side of the uh, infant's mouth. And if you cannot do that, maybe you can uh, put stylet in the tube 
but make sure that the tip of the stylet is uh, not protruding through the tube. And uh, also, uh, then you have to keep the glottis uh, in view and then you insert the tube uh, when the vocal cords are open until the desired uh, tube length uh, while assistant applies a cricoid uh, pressure. The length uh, for each patient is also here in the uh, table endotracheal tube knee. The depth tool is the length. Okay, uh, and then uh, if, uh, if you are an, unable to do this intubation uh, within 20 seconds, uh, you should stop the attempt and reventilate the, uh, the patient with back and mask. And uh, once um, the patient is intubated, uh, you can now remove the laryngoscope and hold the tube firmly with uh, your left hand and uh, connect the tube to the self-inflating back and positive pressure ventilation. And um, you have to confirm the tube position is in the right uh, place by looking at the chest expansion, uh, listen to the lungs air entry and also the stomach. If the stomach is distended, then you might uh, uh, put the endotracheal in the uh, esophagus instead of uh, uh, glottis. Okay, and then uh, you need to secure the tube with adhesive tape and connect the tube to the ventilator or resuscitation bag and um, insert orogastric tube to decompress the stomach and then you have to do a chest radiograph to uh, confirm the position of the tube. Okay, so yeah, that's all. Do you have any question? No? Okay. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Okay, I've got one question, but this is very difficult question. And so, kalau you boleh jawab, I bagi you nine marks of your presentation. Okay, what what do you mean positive pressure ventilation? Positive pressure ventilation too. Uh, it is um to increase the air pressure in in the throat so that the airway does not collapse when the patient breathes in. Then what is the besides positive pressure ventilation? Apa yang pressure ventilation you ada? Uh, this normal ventilation. So normal ventilation you call apa? Um, ventilation. Huh? Uh, the back and mask ventilation. No, no. Okay, uh, normal ventilation is our ventilation. Uh. Normal people, uh -huh. how we ventilate? Macam mana kita ventilate? Uh, how we breathe? Uh, using the air, yeah, air kat luar ni. <laughs> <laughs> nah, kita breathe guna negative pressure ventilation. Oh. Okay. Kita breathe by creating negative pressure dalam intratoracic. So air daripada luar yang high pressure relative higher pressure daripada luar ni, dia akan push air masuk dalam. Faham tak? Hmm. That is just normal breathing kan? Hmm. Kan bila kita breathe in, kita constrict kita punya diaphragm dan kita punya uh, intercostal muscle and then kita increase the volume kan, intratoracic volume so we reduce the intratoracic pressure. So air negatively, the neg we, so we create negative pressure inside the thorax so that air akan masuk dalam. That's how we breathe. Hmm. Normal physiology. So positive pressure ventilation is the other way around. We force air, high pressure air daripada luar untuk masuk dalam badan. So it's totally not physiological. It's against physiology. Faham? Okay, so that's, that's one thing you have to understand. Because if you understand this concept, you will understand how mechanical ventilation works. And then later kalau you buat NS ke, you buat ED ke, uh, you tahu lah macam mana nak manage ventilation. Okay, good. Any other questions? Mm. 
Sekejap. Okay. Uh, boleh next. Next. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh So today uh, I will be presenting on Method dose inhaler with spacer and nebulizer So uh, these two are the aerosol therapy That used to treat the respiratory problem Such as asthma, cystic fibrosis And also infectious uh, pulmonary disease So we will start with Method dose inhaler So Method dose inhaler It is a handheld aerosol device That use a propellant to deliver the therapeutic agent So propellant is propellant is the one that uh, turn the pharmacologic agent uh, to into mist, and this uh, method dose inhaler it need for a correct actuation and also inhalation uh, to ensure that most of the drug being carried deep into the lung instead of uh, deposit on the oral pharyngeal and also uh, the tongue. So that's why method dose inhaler usually will be used along with the Uh, spacer. So this is the spacer. Spacer it will be indicated for a uh, patient with difficulty uh, coordinating the inhalation actuation and also for patient who use uh, MDI uh, containing glucocorticoid uh, especially if the dose ranging from medium to high. So uh, this is a spacer with various size. Uh, we have a spacer with mask and also the mask mask and also mask piece and also we have spacer for children and also adults. So spacer it is usually an open-ended tube that allow the aerosol plume from the MDI to slow down uh, so that uh, the the droplet can be carried deep into the lung uh, and also uh, instead of hitting the back of the throat or hitting the tongue. And also, uh, this spacer can uh, turn the droplet into a very fine mist. And this mist is very fine that most of the patient will not taste or uh, will not taste it uh, as they breathe it in. And usually, uh, we will use uh, aero chamber. Aero chamber is the, this is the aero chamber. It is the spacer that has a one-way valve that prevent the exhaled breath from entering the chamber. So this is a, a proper technique on how to use MDI with spacer. So the first thing is, uh, is you need to hold the MDI upright with the your index finger at the top of the canister uh, and also the bottom uh, and spotted by the thumb at the bottom and then uh, remove the mouthpiece cap, the inhaler's mouthpiece cap and then if the patient uh, is first time use the inhaler or they do not use the inhaler for a long period of time so they need to priming the inhaler first. So what I mean by priming is uh, you shake the inhaler and also spray it into the air for a total up of four times and then uh, but if uh, the patient do not need to prime the inhaler they can start to use the inhaler by shaking the inhaler for five to ten seconds and then They need to attach the inhaler's mouthpiece to the spacer device. Uh, so at the space back of the spacer, there will be a hole there. So they need to attach, uh, insert the mouthpiece of the inhaler into that hole. And then uh, the patient need to exhale fully away from the spacer. Uh, and if the patient uh, use the spacer with mouthpiece, so they need to put the mouthpiece of the spacer into their mouth between the teeth and also close the lips uh, tightly around the mouthpiece of the spacer and make sure the tongue does not block the opening of the mouthpiece of the spacer but if the patient use uh, the spacer with mask they need to place the mask completely over the nose and also the mouth and be sure that uh, the mask has a good seal against the cheek and chin and then Uh, they can start to release the medication by pressing down the top of the canister and 
uh, shortly after pressing it down, uh, they need to breathe in deeply and also slowly through the mouth until the lung are completely filled. And this process should take three to five seconds. And after breathe in deeply and slowly, they need to hold the medicine in the lung for approximately five to ten seconds. What I mean by hold the medicine is hold on their breath. So they need to hold on their breath for approximately five to ten seconds. But for young young children and also toddler or infant, they cannot cooperate with this. They cannot uh, breathe in deeply or they cannot hold on their breath. So in order to fully empty the chamber, they can uh, do multiple inhalation. Okay, so uh, and then if the patient need a second puff, they need to wait approximately 15 to 30 seconds uh, to start the second puff. And then when finished, they need to recap the mouthpiece. And important to be noted that if the inhaler contains a steroid medication, the patient need to rinse their mouth and also gargle with the water after using it. Okay, so that's uh, okay. So next, we will proceed with nebulizer. So this is nebulizer. Nebulizer is usually uh, reused in the acute or critical care setting. And nebulizer, it can be used at home or at the hospital. And this nebulizer, usually it is indicated for patient who is too ill or too young to use handheld device such as the inhaler. And also nebulizer also uh, we use in the situation where large doses of drug is necessary. And nebulizer also uh, used for the medication that available only in liquid form because this nebulizer, it can aerosolize uh, many uh, drug solution. Uh, and also it can aerosolize the drug mixture. Uh, and also nebulizer, uh, it allow minimal patient cooperation and coordination and also patient can have a normal breathing pattern while using the nebulizer. And this is the component of nebulizer. We have here is the nebulizer machine or the compressor, the compressor gas supply and connected to this compressor is the connecting tube. So this is the connecting tube. And then we have the nebulizer cup. This is the nebulizer cup for us to put the medication. And then uh, patient can use the patient is encouraged to use a uh, mouthpiece. So this is the mouthpiece with T adapter mouthpiece and also the reservoir tube, because this mouthpiece uh, it's uh, it's more in efficient in terms of drug delivery, and also this mouthpiece uh, it has no leakage and also no drug deposit on the uh, nasal passage or face. But if the patient cannot use the mouthpiece, uh, they can use the mask they can use the mask so but this mask it is uh prone to leakage and also it is uh, easy for the patient to use but uh it is less efficient and also the drug can be deposited at the face and also the nasal passage okay so this is uh the technique on how to use nebulizer so the first thing is uh, we need to place the patient in a comfortable position. We prefer them to sitting up or partially supine. And then we assemble the apparatus. And then uh, we take the nebulizer cup and fill in the nebulizer cup with the medication or drug uh, with appropriate dose and prescription uh, for at least 3 milliliters. And then uh, close the nebulizer cup tightly, make sure it is tight to avoid the drug solution from spilling over. And then uh, we connect the nebulizer to the compressor or the pressurized gas supply with a flow of 6 to 8 liter per minute using the connecting tube. Okay, so uh, and then we connect the mouthpiece or mask to the top of the nebulizer cup like this. And if the patient use mask, uh, using the strap, we make sure to firmly place the mask over the nose and mouth, leaving no gaps. Or if the patient use mouthpiece, uh, we must insert the mouthpiece into the mouth between the teeth, teeth and close the lips tightly. And then we can start to turn on the compressor machine or the pressurized gas supply. And then uh, we need to instruct the patient to breathe through the mouth, not breathe through the nose, but breathe through, through the mouth, whether using a mask or mouthpiece and encourage the patient to breathe uh, with a slow inspiratory flow and after they take four to no five normal breaths, they need to take a deep breath. 
and periodically uh, tap the nebulizer to return the infected droplet to the reservoir and uh, we can stop the treatment when the nebulizer sputters. So, um, so that's all from me. Uh, any question? Okay, any question? Any questions? Okay, I've got one question. Okay, what happened if you give nebulizer um, with a flow with a air flow of ten lah, ten liter per minute? What happened? Kenapa mesti enam ke lapan? Uh, we uh, we don't have any is it related to the size of the droplet uh, kalau macam uh, less than 6 i i think that uh, the droplet will be more big bigger but for 10 liter i am not sure so kalau bigger dia buat jadi apa tak boleh ke kalau bigger uh, kalau smaller Only, uh, kalau uh, kalau bigger, maybe they can deposit at the uh, the throat. Kalau smaller, oh, so dia kena masuk. Kalau uh, smaller, dia gimana? Dia macam MBI juga. So, masuk kalau uh? smaller, jadi apa? Kalau smaller? Uh, dia uh, easy to carry uh, into the lung. The, the site for the side untuk drug to Okay lah, bronco kan? Bronco spasm ni dekat level mana? If you got asthma At which uh, Kat mana dia jadi bronco spasm? Pathology dekat mana? Kat mana? Dekat You punya bronchos, bronchios kan? You punya <coughs> Respiratory bronchios dia ke? Respiratory Kat mana dia punya? You punya terminal bronchios kan? Respiratory terminal bronchios kat uh, area okay. kan? So with six, 6 to 8 liter per minute Ideally that it is small enough Untuk reach that area, faham tak? Kalau you become, you put lower lower, lower flow Then dia akan end up kat mulut, dekat throat Dekat esophagus, I mean dekat uh, trachea dia Tapi kalau too small, dia akan penetrate down to alveoli So it won't work Faham tak? Faham kan? Faham tak? Okay, so tu lah. Okay, next lah. Next. Ada satu lagi eh? Uh, no. I'm the last one. Habis dah? Uh, Ada lagi presentation ke? Uh, no. Uh, Habis lah? Sepatutnya lima, but uh, one then uh, it's supposedly, supposedly uh, for student hmm. But one student had done earlier Okay, good So just good. for uh, presentation uh, Okay, that's very good uh, Actually, I've, I give you guys the mark already I provide the marks uh, So untuk chest tube, I bagi 8 uh, Bladder catheterization, I bagi 7.5 uh, uh, Intubation tu, I bagi 7 MDI 7.5 Okay So 8, 7.5, 7 and 7.5 Okay, but uh, Between all of these procedures kan, yang you present the, every procedure ni The most important is your MDI, the last presentation ni Okay, the MDI and NAPS is very 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 important Okay, because It can come out in your exam Okay I said I told you guys kan, last time I, I keluarkan soalan your exam and 90, I think 95% of the students mu fail Fail badly sampai I gelak the whole session tu, I gelak Kalau ada two days day, two days ni exam I jaga dua hari, pagi saya petang tu memang I gelak the whole day So don't make me laugh lah, kalau soalan ni keluar and it, it happen you guys yang Candidates, don't make us laugh because you'll be surprised So make sure you betul-betul tahu tau how to give MDI dengan uh, MDI lah especially through spacer and also MDI without spacer because later kan bila you jadi doktor pun even houseman as houseman 
you'll be assessed on uh, in in your logbook there'll be assessment on on uh, teaching teaching your patient how to use MDI and you have, you have to perform this in front of your specialist consultant and also uh, patient huh? so make sure you know yeah? we've got student yang pasang MDI tu pun terbalik so dia masukkan the canister terbalik into the into the <laughs> into the MDI lah. Yang tu okay lihat ada satu yang dia teluk dia put the canister into the spacer you put the MDI into the spacer tau the mouse piece kan, the mouse pun the mouse side tu you letak dekat spacer, bukan canister kat spacer canister you letak dekat MDI and then MDI you attach dekat uh, spacer okay macam-macam lah dia yang terbalik-terbalik lah tapi memang, memang funny lah, it's very funny so okay lah, ada soalan Um, doktor, saya oh. just nak tanya, kalau asma injun, uh, dia boleh sembuh ke? Maksudnya, tak boleh. Dia ada possibility ke waktu dia besar, no asma? Tak boleh. No, it's like this. Uh, principle oh. dia, you tak sembuh from asma eh. It's similar like diabetes. Once you got diabetes, you will never cure from diabetes. It's a chronic disease. So, you will never cure, tapi you can control. Okay, that's why asma itu tak sebut, kita tak sebut Remission, we don't use word remission atau we don't use word uh, cure asthma, we, we use control, good control asthma kan. Sebab asthma, usually uh, children kan dia ada narrow airway kan. Tapi as the as, as time goes kan, bila makin besar, the lung capacity improve, they they will only get symptoms if severe asthma. Faham tak? So if mild asthma, they won't get symptoms. So usually nampak macam dia dah okay. Tapi they still can have bronchospasm. Cuma they will be asymptomatic. Faham tak? So actually dia tak cure. So asthmatic children they won't cure. Tanpa dia bersama. Tanpa dia besar lah. Cuma they can control it. Majority of children by the teenagehood dia akan hilang lah dia punya asma. Tak ada no more symptomatic. Tapi it can really appear after adulthood. Bila dah tua kan. Bila you punya airway dah start to constrict, become less uh, less liable kan dia dah uh, macam tak flexible sangat so you start to get the bongkos tajam balik ok, ada soalan lain? Pastor oh. Doktor, hmm, yang MDI dengan pressurized MDI dia sama kan ke ada different? Hmm, I rasa macam sama je, sama je Meter, do, meter dose uh. inhaler, pressure sama lah. It's, it's the same thing. It's aerosol gen, uh, sama lah. It's sama. So nowadays, uh, kita dah, dah tak guna nebulizer. If you go to any hospital, we don't, we no longer use nebulizer. We use MDI most of the time. Except for some some situation kita akan guna nebulizer. Because these are aerosolized, uh, aerosol generated procedure. Sama macam intubation. Intubation is also intubation, suction, oral nasal suction, these are aerolized, uh, aerosol generated procedure uh, and these are procedure that has to be avoided uh, during this COVID lah. So kalau patient tak ada COVID, you buat suction, you bagi nebulizer and then gembira lah COVID tu. Dia akan berterberangan lah ke seluruh dunia. So we use MDI lah. Uh, kalau you pergi hospital, even suspect pun, we no longer use NAPS unless uh, in very ill patient, that require you nap. Itu pun kita akan bagi dekat negative pressure room. Isolation. Kita tak bagi dekat open. Okay. Ada soalan? Okay lah kalau tak ada. Okay kalau tak ada kita tangguh dengan tasbih kafarah dan suatu masa. Okay, so welcome to the record. Thank you, Atta. Thank you, Atta.